Welcome everyone and thank you for participating in this town hall um, to ensure the best audio performance and to prevent glitches in the feed. Um, we've turned everybody onto video and audio mute. So please leave your um, uh, account that way. And later in the meeting, when it comes to a question answer, answer session, uh, we'll unmute you as, as needed. Um, first, I, I hope that you're all well, and I hope that you, your family, your friends, and your loved ones are all safe and well. Um, I want to say I'm inspired by our community's initial response to this pandemic. Um, people have been logical and thoughtful, but also uh, generous, cooperative, and caring in their responses, um, despite having uh, to make some pretty difficult decisions and face with some difficult circumstances. Um, as an example of this, uh, I hope most of you know that we've donated over a thousand um, items of personal protective equipment like gloves and respirators and, and other um, devices to the local uh, community for uh, distribution to first responders. That was really uh, an uplifting thing for us to be able to do. And I'm inspired by all the interest that we have from people across campus in using our resources like 3D printers to make masks and other um, equipment that people can use in, in first response. So um, thank you for all that you do. Um, and thank you uh, for being such a great uh, part of this community. Um, I know that you're all concerned, uh, not only for your well-being and the well-being of others, but for the impacts that this pandemic um, is having currently and will continue to have um, on your personal and professional lives. Um, we're all in this together. So let me start by giving you my personal story of how COVID-19 has affected my research program uh, for the last 25 years. I've been collecting embryos from my annual killifish uh, for uh, twice a week. And uh, for the first time ever during that time, we've reduced the stocks down to just the minimum number that um, are required to keep the population alive. Um, if this goes on for much longer, uh, maybe for a couple more months, I'll probably have to sacrifice all those fish and my research will be, um, uh, the future of my research will rest in about 2,428 diaposite embryos. I counted every one of them myself that are sitting in an incubator. So, um, you know, I know firsthand what it feels like to make tough decisions right now. And I empathize with all of the decisions you guys are having to make. Um, in this time of great uncertainty and anxiety, uh, we can't change or control the situation that we're in, but we can control how we respond. Um, and the choices that we make today could have long lasting effects on our community and ourselves. The COVID-19 pandemic is fundamentally a biological problem, a biological event. And like any other problem in biology, our knowledge is woefully incomplete. We just really don't know um, a lot of the variables that we would need to know to make good decisions, uh, but we still have to make decisions to uh, try to navigate the, the risks. Um, and we're doing this based on um, some very unreliable information or small amounts of information because of the limited testing that we have. Um, in RGS, we're approaching our response to this pandemic um, like any other biosafety issue. It's really all about risk assessment um, to you as an individual, uh, but also uh, to the greater community. And this is a really important point to stress because sometimes it's the risk to our greater community that has to drive our decisions, while our own personal risk may seem small. Um, the experts say that if your initial reaction to a pandemic such as this seems like an overreaction, that you probably made the correct decision because every day that goes by where we prevent spread of the virus um, will lead to a lower number of people that ultimately are infected and or affected by this pandemic. Um, it would be great to have enough information right now to make uh, decisive decisions on things, but um, we aren't gonna have the kind of information we need to do that uh, for another couple of weeks as the pandemic plays out. So stick with us, we are monitoring this as it goes and we may have to make changes on the fly. Uh, and I appreciate your patience and appreciate all that you've already done and that you continue to do and for being with us today to work on this. Um, I'm confident that together we can weather this storm and come out of it uh, the other end stronger and, and uh, better for the experience. 
Uh, despite the turmoil that this pandemic is causing, some of you may know that it's also creating new funding opportunities uh, for research for which PSU is, is really substantially poised to take advantage of. We have a lot of expertise at PSU in areas um, that the virus is affecting, and we're working right now to try to get groups together so that we can uh, think about how we can uh, get the right information to the right people and, and form groups to really think about how we can um, use this sort of natural experiment, as it were, um, to learn more uh, for future um, instances. We'll be highlighting also individual funding opportunities that come out in our funding ops email. Um, if you receive this, look for those, they'll be highlighted. If you don't receive this email, uh, there's a link to sign up on the RGS uh, homepage. So you can check it out there. Okay, let's get on with the town hall. Um, we're gonna leave time at the end of this town hall to answer the questions that you submitted via the Google form. And you can ask additional questions during this um, uh, town hall using the chat function at any time. We'll try to address those questions that come in via the chat during the town hall if possible, but if not, we'll be sure to address them later in an FAQ document that we'll put up on our webpage. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn over the feed to um, the content experts that have been working so hard to uh, coordinate our response to the pandemic. Um, at this point, I'm going to switch over to uh, Kelly Clifton, our Associate Vice President for Research Extraordinaire, and she can give us an update on lab operations and lab closures. Thanks, Kelly. He has rallied together at this time. Um, so a few things about how we are responding, at least in terms of research operations. I'm going to talk a little bit about the shutdown, the guidance that we're providing in terms of shutting down your lab or studio or project space. So we've been developing these guidelines, taking into consideration the local, state, and federal mandates um, that are out there, as well as a particular set of research scholarly and creative activities that we have here at PSU. And so the situation is evolving, and as it evolves, we'll introduce or ease restrictions with the health and safety of our campus and larger community um, as our highest priority. <clears throat> so as much of this is being de developed and disseminated to you in, in real time, we welcome your comments and suggestions about how we could do a better job of communicating clearly and effectively, um, as well as uh, reflecting your concerns for your particular research. So at this time, all campus research, on-campus research activities should stop except for those that are deemed essential. And so many of you ask, well, what is deemed essential? Um, so essential activities uh, are necessary for the compliance with federal requirements. So this is basically maintenance of animals, maintenance of equipment, or specific biological specimens. So at this time, we want no new experiments to be conducted. And if you have ongoing experiments, they should be finished as soon as possible um, with, with social distancing and hygiene practices in mind. At this time, we also recognize that you might need to access buildings to retrieve items, to reboot your computers, or to maintain your labs. Um, and so buildings are locked, but access is possible uh, to most buildings. And your PSU ID should allow you to access these buildings when you work. Um, however, access control to each building is determined by your college leadership, and you should confirm with your department chair or your dean that access is possible and if your activity is deemed essential or you are allowed access. Um, we've also had a number of questions about uh, a centralized PSU effort to monitor lab equipment. And so at this point, we have no centralized effort for that. We expect that kind of monitoring to be coordinated at the, at the PI and the department level. And this level is, is where the knowledge and expertise res resides with your specific work. So it's acceptable to have some form of regular, <coughs> excuse me, it, it is acceptable to have some form of regular monitoring um, that can be done with limited personnel, again, deemed essential by your college leadership. Um, we would suggest that it's a good idea to gather a list of equipment and locations that need to be checked periodically um, and having someone walk through the building at an appropriate time to check that equipment. Um, also at this time, facilities are maintaining janitorial services for the buildings and we'll provide updates to that and other operational changes as they happen. Okay, uh, the other thing that we've done is 
provided uh, two templates to help you uh, in shutting down your activities. These were shared with everyone uh, via email, but they're also available on the RGS website. The first one is the emergency contacts template. So uh, it's a good idea to fill this out um, uh, for those that are in your lab and share this with your chair and if appropriate with your research team. If you do have a lab, we suggest that it's a good idea to also post this on the outside door of any locations that may contain equipment with alarms so that if someone's walking by, they know who to contact if there's some, some urgent need um, going on in the lab. The second document is a lab shutdown checklist. So this is providing very general guidance. Um, and it's, again, meant to think about the broad set of research and scholarly activities that take place on campus. And so you have to use your judgment in determining what is relevant, relevant and applicable to your research lab or your studio. In this checklist, I recognize that there's been some confusion about uh, purchasing guidelines in the checklist. And so I just want to add some clarification here. All purchases should be limited to just those items deemed essential for remote operations during the spring quarter. Since mail services on campuses are limited and departments and labs are closed, we ask that you keep on-campus deliveries to only those needed to support essential activities. And for these items, investigators need to coordinate with their appropriate people on campus to ensure that delivery can be received properly at PSU um, prior to making those orders. In addition, PSU has also relaxed normal rules that allow some purchases to be shipped directly to your home. So if you can safely receive orders at your home uh, to support approved remote work, we will allow those orders. Also, uh, we also realize that some kinds of orders or specialized equipment have very long lead times and maybe those long lead times might uh, uh, come outside the window in which we are under these restrictions. So those might also be approved, but you should check with your department and college leadership about whether this is appropriate or not. Um, and then finally, service contracts for consultants and other project related needs that can be performed remotely are also allowed. Um, so I hope that clears up some of the questions about purchasing. Again, if you have other questions, you can we will entertain these in the chat or answer them after the webinar. The other thing I wanna talk about is field operations guidance. So our guidance again is comporting with local, state and federal requirements. So all work on or off campus requiring face-to-face -face activities are supposed to stop. Uh, field research that involves human subjects, but that can be done remotely with technology. So either email or telephone surveys, interviews, focus groups for, via teleconferencing, for example, can continue. Um, you may have to modify your IRB uh, approval um, to adapt your current research to be able to be done remotely. And Shannon Roth will talk more about this next. For other types of research that don't require human subjects that are going to be conducted in non-urban areas, researchers need to use their own judgment about whether that conduct can be done safely, meeting the federal, uh, state, and local guidelines, and using appropriate social distancing and hygiene practices. Uh, we do realize that researchers need to be very aware uh, and heed the concerns of the research staff and students in making those decisions. So just being aware of the power relationships that you have um, uh, with those students. Um, so again, we're really happy to uh, entertain your questions. I'm gonna pass this on to Jason, who's gonna talk about animal care as our animal care, fish care expert. Um, so if Jason will talk a little bit more about how we're gonna deal with those things. Thanks, Kelly. So at this point, um, all animal care operations should be down to sort of the maintenance that you need to, to maintain your strains. Um, we will, uh, of course, try to help support you in keeping any um, uh, animals that are irreplaceable alive and well during this um, uh, time. But if there are organisms that you can get by ordering them, um, it might be worth shutting that down and, and reordering later on. Most importantly, if you have an animal care and use protocol right now that's active, you should be in contact with Shannon Roth um, in our um, Office of Research Integrity to talk about your plans. I think most of you have already done that. Um, and I think almost everybody is already down to um, an approved emergency plan. 
if your plans change, you got to reach out to that office right away. And I'm just going to turn it over to Shannon now uh, to talk specifics. Shannon. Thanks, Jason. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm going to pick up where Kelly left off related to the human subjects research pieces. So as she mentioned, it's true, all in person and face to face activities with human subjects have been suspended at this time. So in order to continue human subjects research, all activities must be performed via remote methods. So that includes phone, regular mail, email, online survey or online uh, meeting platforms. <clears throat> and how this might impact currently approved human subjects research. If you have an approved project that will not be paused during this time and the protocol does not already include options for remote data collection, the investigator must submit an amendment to revise the protocol and include remote data collection methods as well as provide any updated consent and recruitment materials for approval. And as a reminder, you do need to have that approval secure before you start implementing those changes to your protocol. These types of submissions will be triaged for review by the HRPP staff in a way that limits delays to any ongoing research activities. And please note that any approved protocols that already include remote methods for remote data collection will, are not impacted by this change and may continue without disruption. <clears throat> For any pending human subjects research protocol, so anything that's currently under review, the HRPP is continuing to process submissions for review and approval, and we're requesting that all pending submissions include a plan for remote data collection. So if remote data collection is not described, our staff will reach out and request the investigator to update the submission to inclu include such a plan. However, if the research is not planned to occur until the suspension of in-person data collection activities is lifted, this uh, review will be paused by the staff, so we will no longer continue with the review. And we've adopted that approach just due to volume because we need to prioritize submissions that will, will be implemented during this period of reduced research operations. However, we anticipate that any paused projects will receive formal approval swiftly uh, once the restrictions are lifted. We don't expect that those projects will take the typical three to six uh, weeks for review and approval to be issued. Uh, so for questions around that, we would intend to try to get those processed as quickly as possible. However, given the unprecedented nature of the situation, it's certainly possible that exceptions could be made during this time. So if you have funding uh, issues that might uh, need to be addressed via an approved protocol immediately, even if you don't intend to start the project, uh, we were more than willing to work with you. So we would just encourage you to work out um, a plan with our HRPP staff, reach out to us and we'll, we'll help you with whatever your situation is requiring. And at this time, research integrity operations are fully functioning. All of our staff are working remotely and each of the committees that we uh, manage, the IRB, the IACUC and the IBC, and all the associated functions are also continuing remotely. And then I'm gonna switch it over to Don Boatman to talk about sponsored projects. All right, thanks, Shannon. Good morning, everyone. I want to share the well wishes of my colleagues and hope that you're all faring well in this remote work environment. I will say for me personally, the situation has given a new meaning to work life balance as all my activities are occurring in about the same 1300 square feet. Um, so I've got there are a lot of topics that we could talk about related to sponsored projects administration. I'm going to limit the comments in this session to kind of the current state of SPA operations, um, some of the information and guidance that we've been getting from sponsors regarding flexibilities and exceptions to kind of normal business practices, and then just talk a little bit about the, um, what's, what we're, how we're looking ahead. So SPA is operating similar to research integrity staff um, at the usual staff um, levels. All of our positions are, are working remotely. Proposal submissions, expenditure approvals, invoices, letter of credit draws, award negotiation, set up are all happening daily. Our staff are available through the normal um, communication channels. And so, but we do ask that you please utilize the team email addresses when communicating with staff rather than contacting them via their personal email addresses. That way in um, the unfortunate event that someone is unable to work or maybe their schedule, um, doesn't make them available at that particular period of time that we are getting your communications and we can make sure that someone is able to respond to you. Um, however, for, and that's, that's the communication channels just for kind of regular day-to-day -day business. 
if you have a question or you need individualized guidance regarding the impact um, of the COVID response on your specific sponsored project, please email spa at pdx.edu. We have used, we're using this contact mechanism as kind of a hotline for triaging questions and um, really focusing in on getting um, immediate responses or timely responses to um, the impact on of this response on on individual um, activities at PSGU. So it enables us to prioritize and address them or assign them to staff that have the bandwidth and are available at that period of time. Because sponsor guidance and communications are changing sometimes on almost an hourly basis, getting the questions about the COVID response in this manner ensures that we're able to um, make sure that the PS, that our responses are the most up to date and our, um, we have individuals that are up to date on the PSU policies and the, and the sponsor policies to be able to answer those questions. So we hope that um, we haven't received very many messages through this um, mechanism already. We've been promoting it through the daily emails and through our website, but we are hopeful that researchers will take advantage of this service to get assistance with their needs. Now I'm going to switch over to highlighting some of the uh, communication that we've received from our sponsors. Um, particularly, the federal government has been the most communicative and has provided the most information about um, how grants and contracts are affected during this period of time, so I'm going to start with that. Um, on March 19th, the Office of Management and Budget, which is an executive office of the President, issued a document called Administrative Relief for Recipients and Applicants of Federal Financial Assistance that are directly impacted by the novel, novel coronavirus due to loss of operations. So while the operational impacts and costs of this response are unknowable at this point, they'll depend upon the spread of the coronavirus and the response that's dictated by public health needs. The memo does provide some short-term relief um, and kind of what to do immediately in terms of administrative financial management and audit requirements that um, are typically are governed by our operations um, in response to complying with uniform guidance. Um, since that time of the issuance of the OMB guidance, many agencies have adopted their own guidelines for implementing flexibilities to the standard requirements. I'm gonna highlight a few of these flexibilities and I encourage you to go to our website for the full list. I also wanna note that while the topics I'm gonna to review um, are from the memo related to financial assistance, which is typically grants and cooperative agreements, there is a memo similar to federal contracts um, that's also on our website and contains many of these same provisions. So the first um, flexibility is related to proposal deadlines. While there's typically a prescribed requirement for vetting and posting of solicitations, agencies are, uh, are given um, some flexibility in changing their existing deadlines and posting new opportunities. For example, NSF has extended the deadline dates for, very, for specific funding opportunities that have deadlines coming up in the, in the coming few months. Some of them have been extended by a couple of weeks, some by a month, and some even three months or, or further out. And that, that link um, to that site, as well as other agencies' deadline sites are on our website as well. Probably the thing that most people are concerned about, and fortunately um, a topic that there's been much guidance about, is charging of personnel. I think as most of you know, personnel is one of the largest um, expenses on sponsored projects, and so it impacts us all um, extensively. So in general, salaries and the associated benefits um, for work may be charged to existing projects, provided that the employees remain engaged in these projects. So um, if the activity is, is able to be done remotely, then work continues on and the salary charges um, follow accordingly. PSU's COVID-19 response policies that are posted on the HR website allow employees who aren't able to work because of the measures taken to curb the virus, they enable them to use sick leave, which is also an allowable charge on sponsored projects. Another area that's come up quite frequently is cancellation charges. So investigators who have incurred costs related to cancellations of events or travel or any other activities associated with the performance of the award, or if there are activities um, required because of the pausing and restarting of grant-funded activities, 
due to this um, current situation, those charges are allowed to this to be charged with Roth and profit. Then there's a lot of flexibility in a variety of areas related to um, ongoing requirements associated with sponsored awards. So the first one is reporting. Sponsors are allowed to um, delay submission of financial reports, um, performance reports, and any other reports that are required for up to three months. So you should be seeing that either in communication from your sponsor regarding that individual award, or you can always check back with the sponsored projects office if you have questions about yours. There's also been um, the authority to waive prior approval requirements. Because many of our sponsors um, already have pretty limited um, situations in which prior approval is required, I haven't seen any specific new flexibilities to date, but I'll keep monitoring that and make sure that we highlight anything um, of note that um, people may be interested in seeing. And then finally, there is a, a ability to get no cost extension from awards automatically. So agencies um, are allowed to extend awards which were active as of March 31st and scheduled to expire prior to or up to December 31st, 2020. They can automatically get a no cost extension for up to 12 months. Now in general, we've been advised that we should not assume that there's additional funds that would be available should the charging of cancellation fees or other activities or payment for, for work that may not, um, for sick leave and during times when people can't work, um, that may, um, may not result necessarily in the availability of additional funding. But we do know that there is, um, We've got some indication that there may be some additional funding available, so we will we are definitely monitoring that very closely. So, but just for right now, consider any cost that you're incurring on your project now will just be costs that you may not be able to recover later on that may impact the um, ability to complete the entire. Um, another recurring theme that we've been getting from guidance across the federal agencies is kind of typical guidance. They're really encouraging um, investigators to contact their program officers. Since that is happening, the program officers may be getting flooded with, with questions, but I have not heard. Um, I've heard that there's been quite good responsiveness um, to date, at least for those that I know of that have contacted. Um, one of the one of the biggest of many of the uncertainties right now, this time, is the impact of this COVID nineteen response on our awards from state and local government agencies and other nonprofit agencies. We've received little to no communication from these sponsors, and so we are going to be um, attempting to reach out to them individually, particularly those that fund many of the projects across um, campus, but. Um, if you have, we are asking that if you as investigators have received correspondence from, from sponsors and you think that that might be something that is um, going to be cross-cutting across the um, many awards, um, we would love to hear that information. We will be reaching out and sharing with you um, the information that we receive and we know that these many of the awards from state and local agencies are a little bit different than our standard federal awards. Awards. Sometimes they have quite a few, um, they're more contractual based and they have specific deliverables and timelines associated with that. And so we're just going to be starting to work, work through those individually and look forward to partnering with, partnering with you investigators as, as we do that. Um, and again, if you have any questions about that or to share information that you have received from particular agencies, please email that spa at edx.edu email address. So then really quickly, I want to take um, a little bit of time to just talk about what's what we're doing to look ahead, particularly for the spring term um, and the work that we're that we're doing for those ongoing projects. Um, graduate research assistants and their work is something that has been quite a topic of discussion. I know we received questions about that, some of which we're able to address today and some that will be forthcoming in future information sessions. Um, I just wanted to say in terms of sponsored projects, we haven't seen a lot of activity requesting changes to GRAs. Um, we encourage GRA appointments. We encourage you to reach out to us and um, 
let us know if you do feel like you're, they're gonna have a change or if you um, need some advice about that. Um, we'd, we'd like to help you with that. The other thing that we're looking at um, once we've gotten past this first sweep of activities is the, our sub award. So when we've issued um, an award to another agency, in general, we know that for federal awards, the same flexibilities that we have as a prime recipient of the awards are also flowed down to the subrecipients. Um, and we are happy to work with you to help communicate that to the subrecipients and modify their agreements as, as necessary. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jason um, and, and the rest of the team that's going to be answering some of the questions that we've received today. Thanks. All right, am I back? Okay. Um, all right, so this is the point in the, in the town hall where we're gonna open it up for questions. So a couple of things about this. If you're new to Zoom, um, and I'm pretty new to Zoom, so I'm still figuring this out. We're taking questions on the fly using the chat function. So if you go to the bottom of your um, Zoom screen, there's a little chat bubble there, click on that. You should be able to share your questions there. We may be able to answer them there, or uh, we'll try to, to get them in person um, if possible as well. Um, but I'm gonna go down now and talk about the questions that we got um, submitted to us through uh, the Google form and just try to make sure that we give you clear answers. If you um, don't feel that the answer that we've given you is clear enough, um, let us know on the, the Zoom chat and we will um, open up the mic so that you can ask a clarifying question. So the first question, many of these have been um, answered by Kelly and Don and Shannon and others um, already, but I'm just gonna go through them question by question and, and reiterate on a couple of them. One of them, the one where people are asking about checking refrigerators and freezers and other equipment, please um, reach out to your department chair and make sure that your department chair has a plan uh, work as a department um, to make sure that that's taken care of. And maybe even um, I would suggest that we coordinate between departments so that we minimize the number of people that need, need to be on campus at any one time. I know the biology department already has um, started this process of listing essential people and, and essential pieces of equipment that need, and resources that need to be monitored. So um, maybe some coordination between uh, groups and department chairs would be really helpful here. Um, the next question is, um, with significant decrease in people in the science buildings, where there's, will there still be regular sanitation service from the janitorial staff? The answer to that is yes, the facilities are still being maintained. The staff is going through and wiping down surfaces with um, antimicrobial um, uh, products. If I were you though, um, I would think that within your labs and in other areas, if you're gonna be in there to do something, you might wanna bring some cleaner and wipe some stuff down, wipe down doorknobs. Um, if you see any issues um, with respect to facilities not being maintained, um, please report those right away to facilities. Um, they also have put some FAQs up on, on their website about uh, facilities maintenance. Um, another comp uh, a question is, you know, can I come to campus if I need to get stuff that's critical for my work? And the answer to that is yes, you can come to campus. Um, you can come to campus to access uh, stuff that you need to do remote teaching and stuff that you need to support your work uh, remotely from home for research. You need to, of course, maintain social distancing and follow the rules that you have been um, outlined by the, the main campus, but it's okay to come to work to do those things. Uh, we are asking people to minimize their time on campus if possible and make sure that you, um, whenever possible, only have one person in a lab at a time, for instance. Um, there's a couple of questions on badge access. Uh, one question is, um, will badge access be revoked for unapproved essential personnel? that previously had access to a particular building, will students lose access? Um, at this point, all of the buildings are locked down uh, with card access only. Um, access to the buildings should be similar to weekend or evening access. So if you have that kind of access beforehand, 
you should have that access going forward. But access is also um, controlled through your department chair and dean's office. So if you um, want to make sure that you have access, you need to check in with them to make sure that um, you actually have access to the building. Um, the next question is with with certain essential services closing or being re significantly reduced, such as the chem stockroom or EHS, what research activities are forbidden as a result, even for approved personnel? Um, I think Kelly did a great job of saying basically, if it's not essential to just maintaining um, activities for federal compliance, then you shouldn't be doing it. So um, we've already sort of covered that. If there's any specific questions that you have for that, or if you think that your situation warrants a variance from that, um, you can contact uh, our, um, RGS at research at pdx.edu, but realize that we are going to be very, very um, strict in trying to keep uh, people from being um, on campus. Uh, let's see. Another question is what circumstances or scenarios would prevent essential research activities from taking place? Of course, this is this would be out of our control. I, I don't see us go into anything more strict than we, what we have right now, unless uh, the governor or some other um, authority uh, tells us that we can't leave our homes. So at this point, I think we can kind of plan to work as we've been working through now, um, but uh, we don't necessarily have control over um, how the continued response will, will occur. So just, we'll try to keep you informed if we hear that things are changing, um, but um, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, okay, here's some other ones. So th these are a bunch of questions that are about PSU's research response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, the question is, will PSU start devoting some lab resources to making test kits and or masks following the lead of institutions like the University of Arizona? Um, so this is um, a really important question. A lot of people in the community are interested in doing what they can to help. And of course, we're committed to doing what we can to help. We have to weigh the needs of the community against the risk to individual personnel um, and against our capacities uh, to do this kind of work. So we are currently right now um, working to figure out how we might be able to use, for instance, our 3D printing uh, capacities um, to, to create masks or, or other um, implements that are useful for the healthcare response. We also have a statewide um, network that's being organized by the HEC, the Higher Education Coordinating Committee, um, where we may be, um, they're asking if we're willing or able to allow our facilities to be used by private industry to um, mount the response to the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, keep, keep checking our website on that. Um, we're doing what we can. Um, to respond with the resources that we have. Uh, the next question is, I've had several individuals and organizations off campus um, ask me whether PSU is providing any sort of coordinated research capability for issues related to coronavirus. There are all sorts of research opportunities for faculty, students, and partner organizations related to the economic, epidemiological, psychological, technological, and sustainability aspects of this unprecedented societal experiment. Might RGS, or parenthetically, or ISS, I wonder where this question came from, compile ideas from faculty that might lead to some competitive proposal ideas? Um, the answer to this is you bet. We're going to try to get people together virtually to talk about this and figure out how we can um, get people together to to take advantage of what's gonna happen both, I think in terms of funding from the uh, federal stimulus package, but also uh, because we do have the expertise to make some really high impact work um, in times like this. So be looking in the future for us to, to communicate with you about that. Um, another question, and this one's regarding soft money funded or lab dependent research. Um, well, uh, the question is, what provisions are being made to support soft money funded researchers who are unable to continue to do their on-campus lab-based research? Will the university be, be, 
be providing backstop funding, compensation for lost revenue, et cetera. So I think this is gonna be a nuanced response because um, depending on the funding source and the work and how long the disruption is, um, it, it's gonna be hard to make some sort of a blanket statement here. But um, as Don pointed out, we're working really hard to um, make sure that we understand what various federal regulations and, and federal funding agencies are saying about this. And um, we're hopeful that that some of the impact can be mitigated. Um, of course, immediately, the immediate response is, is that if you can't work, um, you can use sick leave. And PSU has also added an extra 80 hours of sick leave for these employees. We know that the NSF and the NIH, at least, are allowing us to, to um, apply that to the grant. Uh, but that doesn't um, help you with the long-term problem, which I think we're going to have to work with on a case-by-case -case basis. So please reach out to us so that we can help you with that. Um, another very specific question um, was about RAU site programs. So this question is, I am the PI of an NSF funded RAU site for summer research. Normally 10 undergraduate students will be recruited from universities nationwide. They will participate in research at different faculty labs at PSU. Have you heard anything from the NSF about RAU site programs concerning the COVID-19 impact? I believe there are several NSF funded RU sites at PSU. We need some guidance about this. So um, we reached out to NSF to ask them about this and NSF's response in general has been, um, you need to reach out to your program officer and it'll be program officer specific in their response. They've also listed um, an FAQ on their webpage that can help with this a little bit. I have heard um, a number of different uh, very interesting and sort of exciting alternatives to having people come to campus. I've heard people um, ask for supplements to buy um, virtual reality or augmented reality technology to send to people so that they can have some sort of a virtual um, site visit. Uh, and I know that our CEMN site visit uh, or uh, RU actually has um, software developed to do um, remote learning on electron microscopes at least. So I think the answer to this is going to be, uh, um, you know, it's going to be up to your specific NSF program officer. We're happy to help you to have that conversation um, or to be part of that conversation to figure out how we can help support um, you at this time. Um, it is pretty safe to say that bringing people to campus um, in the next, at least during spring term is, is not possible. And it's highly likely to be very limited during the summer. Um, it really, a lot of this just hinges upon how well the early measures that we've put in place here in Oregon to try and stem the spread of the virus through social distancing work. If they work well, we might be able to have some limited um, on-campus activity this summer. If they don't work well and we have a very large explosion of cases as has happened in other parts of the world and parts of this country, then we may um, continue to have to work remotely for, for uh, some time. So I think we're just gonna have to wait and see how this plays out. Um, here's a very specific question. Um, I heard five new DRAs have been hired. Will the College of Education have a designated DRA again? Will pre and post awards go through the same person as in the past? So uh, the answer to this is yes, we did. This is great news. We hired five new DRAs and they're currently being trained um, and coming up to speed and they're working on sponsored projects as we speak. Um, they're of course working remotely. We haven't at this point um, figured out how to deploy all of these employees um, and what their portfolio is going to um, ultimately be. Uh, we've changed the way uh, that people are interacting with our office. So there are forms now where you would, um, for instance, uh, uh, notify the office that you have a proposal that you want to submit. But uh, pre and post award um, uh, activities will probably um, be handled by teams going forward and not by a single point of contact. Uh, but we're still working through that. Um, and it's going to take us a little longer given all of the work that we're doing to make sure that we're responding appropriately to this pandemic. Um, 
there was a very specific question about field research as well. Um, the question is, what is the impact on biological field research that does not involve human or animal subjects? And I think uh, Kelly um, did a great job of talking about this. Um, I think that you're going to have to use your judgment um, and uh, decide whether or not the benefits outweigh the risks for you and for your staff or students. And I think I just want to reiterate um, that uh, because of the power dynamics there, please be aware that your students may not feel comfortable leaving their houses. They may themselves um, have underlying conditions that make them more susceptible to the virus, or they may be caring for loved ones that are susceptible, and they may not want to talk to you about that. Um, and so we need to be especially caring and understanding as we deal with this. Um, Okay, I think I'm nearing towards the end of the ones that we can really handle. Um, there's some research integrity IRB ones that I think already were handled and the, the answers are too long to go through again. Um, here's another one. This question is, will PSU offer any funds to offset research productivity disruptions due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, particularly during uh, currently funded periods. So the, the answer to this one is, is um, we don't know. At this point, we don't have any bridge funding set aside for anything, um, but we're actively pursuing ways that we can figure out how to support people. Um, I'm hopeful that the, the stimulus bill that's coming out of Congress, um, they've set aside $13.5 billion for the higher education um, uh, impacts, I think 50% of that or more needs to go directly to students um, to aid their um, hardships during this time. But there are grants and other um, mechanisms in there where we may be able to, um, to help if um, a sponsored project has been negatively impacted, at least a federal sponsored project. So, but we won't know that yet. It's a, it's a huge bill. We need to read through it. We're working with government relations to figure out um, exactly what that is going to mean for us. Um, if you have concerns though, please um, make sure you contact that email address, spa at pdx.edu to get that grant specific advice. Cause it's really important um, that we document if there are effects, it's important to document what those effects might be. Um, there's a couple questions here about graduate students. Can we get Mark Woods? You're on, you're on line here, aren't you? Yep. Good. I'm going to ask the question and, and maybe I'll, I'll have you handle the answer. Does that sound okay? Yep. Okay. So the question is, um, as we all know, the Halden research is prolonging the time graduate students will need to be enrolled in their respective programs. Most programs also have a dictated length of time before an assistantship is withdrawn. How will graduate students be supported for the delay in research that may affect assistantships? You want to give that one a go, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, there is an inevitability um, that we that graduate students are going to be affected by this, um, and uh, the graduate school is is trying to figure out. We're trying to look at all of our policies to figure out what. Um, we can we can do to um, minimize the impact on students um, but funding assistantships are program specific um, uh, parts of the graduate students um, um, time here so it's going to depend largely on what the source of funding is uh, whether the um, um, uh, which program they're in um, we are we would hope that um, in terms of um, whether a student, the last part of the question, um, whether a student, what will happen to students in programs that have time limits on support, that the, that the programs will take into account what has happened um, and be flexible in ensuring that students remain supported. But that's really a very much a program specific question. So where graduate students have um, concerns about this, they will need to address those directly to programs. In terms of um, things like timelines, 
the graduate school's already taken into uh, taken two steps based on the information that we sort of have now to try to minimize the impact that graduate students are going to suffer. The first is that uh, for any student who is advanced to candidacy, typically they would need to be continuously enrolled. It's, in other words, they would need to have um, uh, register for at least one credit every term. For, for this spring term, for students that uh, either are unable or unwilling to be on campus, um, we're going to um, waive that requirement, um, and that doesn't uh, that requirement doesn't carry over into summer. So if this continues, we will revise the the, the guidance on that um, as it becomes appropriate. Um, but it the we won't be looking at that specific guidance unless we're starting to see fall term being impacted. The one that the, the other part that summer might impact if this goes into summer is doctoral time limits. Um, there are you sh you are uh, I'm sure aware that there are various time limits that doctoral students have to meet for their comprehensive exams, their proposal defence, and their final defence. <clears throat> And um, we have extended those by a term automatically for anyone who is um, is impacted by this, um, and we will continue to extend doctoral time limits if this uh, situation goes longer. But at the present moment, we don't um, we don't know where we, where we are. I think that's been a, a sort of a consistent theme. If there are things that the graduate school has not thought of, um, please do let us know. Um, we will um, try to work out how to be flexible for all of our students um, uh, to minimize the impact that this is going to have. That's, I think I've covered everything. Did I get everything, Jason? Unmuting myself. Yes, I think you did. Thank you, Mark. Um, okay, I think we're almost through the questions that came in. Um, one question is, um, are there additional restrictions for graduate and or undergraduate student researchers compared to the already set restrictions and guidance for faculty and staff? Um, we're continuing to work on this. Um, this is, of course, you know, weighing people's ability to make progress through their degree versus um, uh, versus, you know, the need to respond to the COVID-19 uh, crisis here. Um, one thing I will say is that um, as we think about who is essential to go into the lab and check on things or whatever, that um, undergraduates are not, should not be used in the, as those essential personnel. Maybe graduate students that know the equipment and those sorts of things, but please um, do not ask undergraduates to come in and check on your lab or do any sort of work um, in your research lab at this time. Um, I think that's, that's just sound advice there. And then another question is, um, can a student who can't do research in the lab stay on RA and for how long? So this is, um, I, the, the answer to this question is it's up to you as the PI, of course, it's your grant um, and you have to manage the productivity on that grant. What I can say is that as a campus, we have been super supportive of our graduate students. And as far as I can tell, the vast majority of people are continuing to support their students. And um, we have enough work apparently that is backlogged on writing and data analysis and, um, and whatnot that we can keep them moving for at least a term. Um, I am concerned that, you know, as time goes on, the, the amount of that kind of work that can be done remotely is going to become less and less or hopefully they'll get it all done and we'll be uh, ready to generate new data. Um, so some of the answer to this really depends on the length of the response um, and what uh, the specific needs of each grant are. So I encourage you to support your students in every way that you can and that if you're running into that situation where you're running out of work for them, um, and, and it wouldn't be appropriate to keep supporting them because they actually can't do any work, that you reach out to us um, through the various mechanisms we've talked about so that we can figure out um, what to do, basically. Um, okay, so I think I've gotten through all of the questions that came in through the Google form. And um, 
I think that, um, well, there's one, at least one question that's come through on the chat uh, from Elise Granick. Um, and it asks about um, undergraduates doing honor theses in our labs. Um, so what do we do with those students that are trying to finish an honors thesis um, this quarter to graduate on time? Uh, I'm going to have to say that I can't answer that question right now because I think that really depends a lot on um, the Honors College and their thoughts on this. But I will, um, I'm going to write it down right now. I'm going to reach out to Shelly Shabon and to Brenda Glasket and I'll figure out an answer to that question and um, get it on our FAQs. Um, are there any other questions that you guys have? Because I'm seeing surprisingly few in the chat. Uh, we can also, if you would like to ask a question but don't want to type it in, you can type in in the chat, hey, I've got a question, and then Sean can unmute you uh, so we can actually talk in person, which would kind of be nice because it seems like a monologue at this point, and it would be nice to hear somebody else's voice. So um, somebody please ask a question. I can see all of you guys on here, so I'll start asking people if they have questions soon, if you guys like. Okay. Um, some of them are starting to come in. How about um, Jonathan has a question. Jonathan Bird has a question. Do you want to unmute him, uh, Sean? Oh, you, you, I've, I'm unmuted now? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Oh my gosh, okay. Uh, well, you asked, you said uh, to put questions. So, I mean, my question is, um, I mean, I, I get, I get what we're doing here and it makes total sense. Any thoughts on, um, you know, do you see it? Do you think, do you think we'll be able to have like social distancing research in the lab perhaps in, in the future? Um, I was, you know, if we could all be six feet apart or, or have masks on, um, any, any thoughts on that? Or you, you think we're going to be working at home for the next, um, two or three months? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. So, um, and, and I, I don't think we have enough information to make a really good um, uh, determination on that at this point. And that determination will probably be made at a university level is my guess. Um, but I will say this, um, uh, we've already committed as a university to going remote for the complete of spring quarter. So we have that. Um, so you will be teaching remotely for that whole time. And uh, of course, I would love for us to get people back in the lab and working um, sooner rather than later, as long as it's safe. Uh, and so we're just really gonna have to see how bad the spread is and um, see if we can figure out a way to um, to think about some limited operations where we have social distancing in place. So I think, you know, I wouldn't plan on this for the spring quarter, um, but we are working on, on trying to figure out if that's feasible. And if it is feasible, um, it, it would have to be approved by deans and department chairs and everything as well. So there's a lot of discussions that have to go on, but I, I understand what you're saying. Um, and I think- yeah. <clears throat> It was more just a, an opinion at the moment. Uh, I mean, I, I get, I get, I get it. I mean, I, I, I think though, like in ten weeks, we should know more. I hope what yes. we can do. Yeah, I hope you so know. too. And I'm hopeful that we've been, um, as a university anyway, and somewhat as a Portland metropolitan area, pretty aggressive at trying to shut down um, contact with people and social distancing. Although, I, I know. A lot of people didn't take it seriously, at least at first. So it really does depend on how bad the outbreak is uh, for us, um, how soon we'll be able to get back to any sort of limited or, or normal operations. I know that the university as a whole is not expecting that until um, it May at the earliest, but probably um, even after that. Okay. 
Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, are there other questions out there? Let's see. Shelby. Shelby Anderson, where are you? We should unmute you so I can hear you rather than read your question. Oh, um, Dawn already answered it. I just missed, I think, when she was talking about proposal submissions. And I was wondering if we could still put in new proposals. And it sounds like yes. Yes, yes, yes. As many proposals as you can. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, we've got Jeff uh, Rook, our um, Director of, of Environmental Health and Safety with us. Maybe we can have Jeff talk a little bit about waste concerns and lab, um, things like that. Jeff? Excellent. You can you hear me? Yes. All right, well, uh, uh, thank you very much for having me on this town hall as well. One of the things that EHS wants to be able to uh, continue offering and uh, to all of our research is the, the baseline EHS services. So when it comes to uh, waste collection, chemical pickup, uh, as well as in-lab support. So uh, understanding that there is a massive disruption to everybody's normal, uh, normal operations. Although EHS is operating on a skeleton crew and as remotely as possible, uh, if there are things that are coming up from labs with regards to uh, the bio waste uh, or chemical waste, if you're closing down labs, we want to make sure that uh, still utilize the same practices that you were before. Um, we actually have changed our operations. So we'll have someone come in either really early in the morning or later in the evening to make those collections out of labs. So as you're shutting down labs, um, as, as ben has been requested by research, um, we will work around your schedules. Uh oh. I think that Jeff has glitched out. Um, are you? Okay, well, we've lost Jeff. Such goes the uh, our new reality here. Um, maybe once we get him back, we can uh, have him pick up on that. Uh, let's see. It looks like Elise Granick has a question. Uh, Sean, you want to let Elise ask that question? Oh, I think it, am I unmuted? Thank you. Um, can you hear me, Jason? Uh-oh, now I can't hear you. I, I muted myself. Yeah, I can hear oh, you. Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah. Um, so if we have a student who's supposed to be a um, having a summer GA appointment and is working on a project that's one of those ongoing projects that has live animals. Um, can we still do a GA summer letter? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes, as long okay. as work can be done safely and it's already been, you know, approved. Um, I think, um, you know, again, we're going to know a lot more here in the next few weeks how things look okay. and, and what uh, summer looks like, but I don't see any reason that we couldn't get the um, the appointment letter ready to go. You might want to give us a few more weeks just to see how this all plays out before we make any strong commitments uh, for some. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Jason, I have a comment about that. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Cheryl. As far as letters, um, Faculty and GA, GRAs in general, we don't do letters anymore. It's, a, it's through the EPAF system. So it's pretty quick. Um, it's a little bit quicker than letters. So we could uh, put it in the EPAF system and it can sit there and then not if it, you know, it can sit there for approval or um, we can delete it if it doesn't get approved or if things change, but I don't know if it's something you want to do too far ahead. Um, planning for it, great, but I don't know if we actually want to enter anything yet. Good point, Cheryl. Thank you for making that clarification. Um, uh, let's see. It looks like Lauren Rust, um, one of our graduate students, has a question. Um, 
Lauren, are you there? Oh, I'm muted. Hello. Hey, Lauren. How you doing? You know, surviving. Doing the best I can. So, yeah, my question was regarding mostly uh, graduate students and defenses. Um, a lot of people are planning to defend spring term, summer term, and if we're not welcome back on campus, how does that work with the committee and a defense that's supposed to be free and open to the public? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I'm hoping Mark will unmute himself on this um, to help me out. I'm going to... Yeah. Um, I'm going to start by saying I've got three students that are supposed to be um, defending this quarter. So we're planning to do remote um, uh, um, defenses and using something like Zoom and allowing them to be open to the public. But I'll let Mark um, uh, go ahead and expand on that. Looks like Mark is... Um, he's not muted, but he's talking and nothing's happening. Yeah. No. <laughs> I can't hear you, Mark. Um, anyway, I, I think that, Lauren, we want to help make sure that students that, that need to graduate can graduate. And so I'm pretty sure the graduate school has already gone through that. We'll make sure, though, um, that we get very clear um, instructions on the FAQ after this so that students can see um, who to contact and what all the plans are for having uh, remote defenses. I'm going to write that down right now. Does that answer your question, Lauren? Yeah, mostly. Um, I, I, yeah. <laughs> Thank what, you. What part of it, what part of it doesn't it answer? I just want to know like the logistics of what a remote defense would look like and how we would ensure the committee members were there and if people from the pub or I mean from the university needed to be there. Yeah. Well, it'll probably look a lot like this. Okay. To be honest with you, it'll probably be okay. over Zoom. Um, but you can make Zooms public so mm -hmm. um, you, people can, you know, <laughs> somebody could drop in and, and watch. But the sort of defenses that we um, think of um, normally, are the in-person things probably aren't going to happen in, in spring. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, there was a question by Jen Morse. Do you want to let Jen um, unmute Jen? Hi, yeah. Can you hear me okay? I can. Hi, okay, Jen. great. Yeah, hi. Um, I have a few students who uh, are doing field projects for their research and they can basically go out in the field alone, monitor plant growth, collect samples. Most of their work is going to be done in the field and then processing data at home. So is, if, as long as areas are open to the public or they get permission from the agency that manages the sites and, they, and if they practice social distancing, if they have to work in pairs, is that allowed? Because delaying is going to miss, cause them to miss a whole year um, because they're looking at pheno phenological patterns in forests and things like that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think that's a really good one. And I, this is where I think field work is one of those nuanced um, things. So I personally think that as long as that is consistent with um, whatever um, executive orders are controlling our movement around in, in the community, that if you're going to be out in a remote location um, to do your work and you're not around other human beings, that it should be just fine for you to continue that work. I see really no difference between that and being sitting in your house. Um, the, the things to consider, I guess, are one, remember that we have satellite um, trackers. So if people are going to be out by themselves, um, I would prefer we have some way to get a hold of them or contact them in case of an emergency. So we might think about uh, making sure that they have some way to get a hold of people. And then the other thing to consider is, is that any work that we do outside of our homes right now may, um, you know, if there is an accident, it requires a, a response from people that may be um, inundated with dealing with, with a COVID-19 outbreak. So, you know, you getting into a, a minor car accident or something like that, um, 
uh, you might not get the same response time that you uh, would have gotten uh, under normal circumstances. So I think those altered emergency services um, that might be available should be taken into account as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. I see Michael Bowman um, is here. I guess you guys can unmute yourself, I've been told. So Michael, if you want to unmute yourself and give us some update on access to library materials, that'd be awesome. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So when the building reopens on Monday, we're only opening the first floor. No one will be allowed to go up into the stacks and we won't be checking anything out at circulation. Um, so what, we, what we'll do for people who want things physically in the building is we'll mail things to people's houses. So you just, well, we have a page up already for services for spring 2020 and just fill it out and we'll mail it to you or we'll scan a, a couple articles or a couple chapters per day and just send you PDFs. If you want, there are some laptops and Chromebooks. We'll also have document cameras, webcams, um, head, USB headsets, and eventually, hopefully, Wi-Fi cell hotspots. Those will be checked out like at the back. You'll make an appointment and at the back door. Uh, obviously, all our electronic resources are available, and some publishers have been making additional things available. So, for example, World Scientific has made all of their articles available back to 2001. Um, since this is just temporary, we're not adding those to the catalog. So what I would recommend is if you're looking for an article and it turns out it's something we don't have, it's worth checking the publisher's website directly. It may have been made available for free for the duration of the pandemic. Great. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that Jeff made it back online. Um, Jeff, did you want to finish your um, uh, comments about environmental health and safety? All right. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, it's great. No power at the house on top of the pandemic. It's really uh, <laughs> fun. Um, so yes, uh, environmental health and safety will continue offering all of the services that we did previously. We're here to assist and support all of the research faculty through anything that you're going to be coming up with. So um, really the best thing that we can ask is that reach out to reach out ahead of time. Uh, if it's for um, waste pickups or support, go ahead and use the work order system that you've been previously using. That will stay the same. Um, and then uh, there might be some delay in that just because we do not have someone on campus every day. Um, but we'll still support uh, you the, uh, however we can uh, in, in that respect. So that's really... Um, what I wanted to make sure I shared. And then also the EHS group email uh, that we have, it's just ehs-group at pdx.edu. That goes out to the entire EHS crew. So if there's any concerns or questions that you may have with regards to your research uh, that we can support, uh, anyone in the group can, can uh, respond to you on that one as well. Great, thanks Jeff, I appreciate that. Do yep. we still, um, I saw Todd Rosensteel was um, theoretically, are you there? Tom? No, Todd. That's too bad. I was going to see what the dean's office might have to say. Um, well, it looks like we're kind of almost um, out of questions, unless anybody has any new ones. Um, feel free to unmute yourself right now and ask a question and we'll try to deal with it. Otherwise we can wrap this up a few minutes early. No questions? I do see, um, Scott and Jack will put on the, the um, chat. Speaking of Todd, what's the status of the SB1 remodel plans? Um, the, what I can tell you about that is, is that remember that the legislature closed the short session without deciding on a capital projects appropriation bill. Um, so right now everything's up in the air. However, they I think are gonna meet again in a special session pretty soon and we should find out more about that. 
I think the chances are still very, very high that we're going to get a big chunk of money to remodel Science Building 1. Um, but of course, it's been kind of put on hold as um, the state tries to figure out what to do about this pandemic. But um, I'm sure that once we get through this initial shock of having to do everything remotely and um, having to shut down our labs, that we'll get back to having those um, uh, what now seem like mundane conversations about things like whether or not we're going to uh, um, remodel a science building. Um, any other questions? Any of my uh, team want to chime in now and cover anything that we, you don't think that got covered well enough or any questions that are burning in your mind? I, can you hear me, Jason? Yes, I can hear you now. Mark. Oh, well, I, sorry, I don't know what happened. I just wanted to, obviously, it, I didn't um, mention the, the graduate school policy is that a defense can be held remotely. It's been that way for a couple of years, so this isn't a new policy. So anyone can have their defense, as Jason said, it would end up looking a lot like this, um, can have their, their defense um, remotely in this format. Um, and that will meet all of the graduate school's requirements. Awesome, thank you, Mark. Anybody else? Kelly, you got any remarks from the newsroom, from the COVID-19 uh, center? 24-7, <laughs> we're here to serve. <laughs> um, reporting here from Southeast Portland, uh, I just wanna say a uh, great job team and thank you all for spending time with us today. And we might be having another one of these in another week or so because this is an ever-changing environment. Um, but we're always happy to entertain your questions, uh, whether we're online or not. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, then I guess we'll sign off. Sean, are you going to shut us down? Thank you all. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> hey, too. Take care. <laughs> Looking good. Thanks. <laughs> you too, man. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>